The year was 2000. We had all survived Y2K. Kobe and Shaq were beginning their dynasty of the NBA with the Los Angeles Lakers. Brian Urlacher was a rookie for the Chicago Bears and taking the league by storm. The Yankees were on their way to winning their fourth World Series in five years, becoming the best dynasty in baseball of my lifetime. The WWF was dominating in the Monday Night Wars, and I was a 19-year-old working two jobs at the time. But best you believe... That when it came time for Bash at the Beach, knowing the history of Bash at the Beach and some of the big significant moments in WCW history that always seemed to kind of happen at Bash at the Beach, I made damn sure, as broke as hell as I was at this time, that I bought this pay-per-view. And I ultimately bought this pay-per-view for one single reason, and that was to see my hero, Hollywood Hulk Hogan, squash that Memphis mid-card piece of crap who, for the moment at least, shall remain nameless. Now, even back in 2000, I knew WCW was in a bad, bad way creatively. Vince Russo had taken over the book, then lost the book, and then he came back. It just wasn't the same WCW. And I was hanging in there, and a lot of people, frankly, were hanging in there. Um, But you could just go back and look at the year 2000, and even being in it at the time... You just knew this wasn't very good. You knew the product was substandard. You knew that this company really lacked for a vision and a creative direction going forward. And I look back at this show and I wonder how many tickets they actually sold as opposed to old WCW trick, how many tickets they just actually gave away in order to fill the venue. At least I will say this, going back to 2000, It is still striking how much more into the actual show the crowds were compared to now. We weren't having stupid this is awesome chants. People were actually into the characters. They were actually into the matches, even if a lot of the shit didn't make any damn sense. And on a side note, back in 2000, I thought the commentary team of Tony Schiavone, Scott Hudson, and Mark Madden was substandard at best. They annoyed the ever-loving piss out of me. Now, 17 years later, revisiting this pay-per-view again, I long for the days for these three guys as a commentary team. It is not so much a compliment to them, even though maybe looking back now, they weren't as bad as I imagine. It is more of an indictment about how bad commentary has gotten in professional wrestling and most specifically, specifically, the WWE. Now, This was a terrible show. Let nobody spin that on you. This was bad, bad, bad on a variety of levels. Now, it started off okay. That traditional cruiserweight title match that kicked off the show, Chavo and Juventud Guerrero, it was a solid opener, which you came to expect out of the cruiserweights from WCW. But this pay-per-view smelled of Vince Russo every freaking where. Like, even Chavo Guerrero wasn't Chavo Guerrero at this point in time. He was motherfucking Lieutenant Loco. Because, of course, that was Vince Russo thinking something stupid was going to get a guy over instead of, oh, I don't know, his last name, which had legacy and lineage for generations in the goddamn business. Again, that was just the start of this shit show. And you could really, truly go back and look. And as history's played out over the years, you could see Vince Russo's hand It's all over this. His fingerprints were everywhere. It just smelled and reeked of it, bro. And let me point out what specifically I'm talking about. All of these Vince Russo elements that you saw in this show, bro. There were two major themes playing out throughout the course of the night. Number one, was Hollywood Hulk Hogan going to show up and face off with the Memphis mid-card piece of crap and take this title shot since he wasn't on Nitro It wasn't on Thunder the week leading up to Bash at the Beach 2000. And number two, for some particular reason, Vince Russo had this fascination with the Young Dragons being whatever the fuck the Young Dragons were supposed to be, creeping on Ernest the Cat Miller and hitting him multiple times throughout the course of the night. Where is that music coming from? We still don't know and we don't fucking care. 
Big Vito successfully defended his hardcore championship. You heard that right. Big Vito, hardcore champion, against Ralphus and of all people, Norman fucking Smiley. Because, of course, when you think of hardcore professional wrestling, you think of Norman fucking Smiley. A wedding gown match between Daphne and Miss Hancock where they're fighting over the attentions and affections of David Flair. Not Ric Flair, the nature boy. Woo! David Flair. Ugh. To where we see David Flair and Crowbar in their skivvies before either one of the women. This match goes a few minutes only for Miss Hancock to just randomly grab the fucking mic and take her own fucking dress off and lose the match. And then we throw a bunch of cake around and then we have to spend several minutes with the ring crew having to clean this shit up off of the fucking mats and then we have to sit there and stall for fucking time. Because of course none of this fucking mattered. If you were just going to do this then just have Miss Hancock go out there and take her fucking dress off and save us the mess of the goddamn wedding cake. Tag team called Chronic won the WCW Tag Team Championships for the first time. And while I liked the team, let's not get away from the fact that this team was called Chronic and you got random lighted up references throughout the match because of course, this is the type of shit that Vince Russo got his jollies off to. Mike Awesome and Scott Steiner fight for the United States Championship and they fight all over the building and arena even though this was not a no disqualification match as far as I could remember and as far as the commentators knew but we did chairs, we stayed out of the ring longer than 10 seconds, all of this but of course in Vince Russo's world none of the rules fucking matter, you just do whatever the hell you want and it's stupid. Only so that way after all of this crap has happened Ernest the Cat Miller, who's been beaten by the Young Dragons multiple times throughout the course of the night, comes out like nothing happens to ultimately threaten Scott Steiner not to use a Steiner recliner. He's going to strip him of the title, so that way Steiner does. So that way, of course, what happens, he strips Steiner of the U.S. title because all of this shit made absolutely no fucking sense. Of course, it's Bash of the Beach 2000. Who could forget about the glories of the graveyard match with Vampiro and Demon? This was trying to do the Broken Hardys crap 17 years ago, but having a fucking knucklehead like Vince Russo booking this shit. Because ultimately Vampiro is going to move the needle, right? And of course having a match concept where you pre-record the shit outside of the arena and nobody can fucking really see what has actually happened because you didn't bother to get any real lights. Ooh, it's gorilla style as a flashlight. This is going to be great. No, it fucking sucked. At one point in time, the ref, Charles Robinson, is going in and having to bail Demon out of the freaking water or else what? He's going to fucking drown? And then, of course, the whole concept is you have to get back to the freaking arena. So how the hell did Vampiro get back to the arena so quickly? Was there a graveyard right next to the arena? Did he grab a taxi? You didn't have Uber back fucking dead. All of these questions that never were answered because we didn't fucking bother to answer them just so that way Vampiro could come back into the arena and we could have Sting come out of the coffin and fucking attack him all the while multiple times throughout the match. We're calling him the demon, but then we're also calling him Dale Torborg. Which one is it? Are we pretending this is some type of work? Or are we sitting there and just saying, fuck it all, we'll just call him by our real name. Everything about this graveyard match was fucking stupid because Vince Russo was fucking stupid. Shane Douglas and Buff Bagwell had a pay-per-view match. And if that doesn't say stop enough, of course you had to throw in the element of a young, beautiful Tori Wilson coming out and slapping Shane Douglas, only to then later also hit Buff Bagwell, and I guess ultimately be on fucking Shane Douglas' side. All of these years later, I'm still fucking confused about how any of that made any fucking sense, or how anybody thought Bagwell and Douglas having a match on pay-per-view was a good fucking idea. In the year 2000, Goldberg and Kevin Nash still had a thing, were wrestling over Scott Hall's contract. I really don't need to say any more than that, do I? And then, of course, we come to the coup de grace, if you will, of Vince Russo and Vince Russo bullshit and how he did his part to help kill and run down the professional wrestling business. It was always a game for Russo. And he always thought, since we all know it's fake, we all know it's scripted, let's go out there and remind everybody how fake and scripted this shit is because we think, oh, if we shoot and we do work shoots, that's going to really draw the people in. And has been proved in over the years, that really doesn't work that way. 
Now imagine me at 19 years old, working two jobs, scraping by, getting by on ramen soup and hot dogs and budding lunch meat till the cows come fucking home, in part so I could save money to occasionally have some entertainment in my life, which is buy pay-per-views like this one. And me being a Hogan fan from my early kid days, now here's still Hogan, of course, main eventing in 2000 because that was what was called for, but... This was what I ultimately bought the pay-per-view for. And of course, instead of me getting the glory of seeing the greatest icon in the history of professional wrestling squash, this Memphis mid-card piece of shit, we got this work shoot bullshit instead. And even back in 2000 watching it live, I said, what the fuck are they doing? Why are we doing some work shoot bullshit? This was never a shoot. It was never anything. As much as Hogan got his feelings hurt over the years about it and had tried to pretend like it was a shoot, this was always designed to be a work shoot. What it was, it was a work shoot gone wrong. There was no real plan in terms of where's the payoff and the return for this, even though they tried to tell you there was. There fucking wasn't because, again, it involved Vince Russo. So we're here worried about the today and we don't give a shit about the tomorrow. Why would you sit there and do this shit? This is like a David Copperfield, David Blaine type when they're they're doing their show. And everybody knows going in, it's magic. It's an illusion. It's fucking fake. But imagine somebody like David Blaine or Copperfield in the middle of their fucking show saying, hey, I know I asked you to suspend your disbelief and be entertained by the theatrics and the magic of everything that is going on, but here is a, your obligatory reminder that all of this is scripted, planned out, choreographed, fake, and bullshit. You're taking fans and expecting them to suspend their disbelief then you're shocking their system and putting them in an entirely different mindset that reminds them, oh, I'm a fucking idiot for actually believing that this shit is real. Why in the fuck would I bother watching? I knew going in it's not real, but now they're just insulting my intelligence by telling me how fake and bullshit and choreographed this is. If I'm getting reminded of this all the time, why would I bother watching any fucking match? Why would I need any fucking match? There is no payoff to any fucking match. And frankly, it helped this type of shit to create the environment that we have in the wrestling business today where we focus too much on the backstage politics and all the other bullshit of who's getting pushed and who's not and all this crap and it circles back directly to people like Vince Russo. There were elements to blame of Paul Heyman in this, no question about it, a little bit of Bischoff, but Russo took this shit to a whole different level. And the last thing I needed to see when I had spent my hard-earned money on Bash of the Beach 2000 was to see Vince fucking Russo cutting a work shoot promo on my fucking hero and icon Hulk Hogan. This was just dumb. And no matter how many times you use the word shit, 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 it doesn't make your promo edgy. It doesn't make it hard hitting. It doesn't make it cool. It doesn't make it anything other than a steaming pile of Russo shit, bro. Like, where did you fuck did you think this was all going to go? Dude, give me that shit that you had a plan. Again, this is Vince Russo. There was no fucking plan. Why would you do this? If you want to believe the whole bullshit of they were trying to get Hogan off of TV because it cost him too much to have him, maybe there's something to that. Maybe there's not. All I know is, why would you spend all this time building up to a pay-per-view match like this knowing that you did some similar shit a year and a half ago as a company with the finger poke of doom you got some immediate payoff to that, but long term, that was harmful. What the fuck made you think in 2000 and that this is going to work, especially when the other person was the Memphis mid-card piece of shit? And the only reason I got any type of satisfaction back in 2000 and again today about the whole thing and the way it played out was because it was ultimately Hulk Hogan going over the right way that he should have over that Memphis mid-card piece of crap. He didn't even need to hit him because it wasn't necessary because Hulk Hogan would have fucking destroyed Jeff fucking Jarrett. Jarrett could have busted 50 fucking guitars over Hogan's head. He wasn't winning on this night, brother. That's the only redemption I got. The only satisfaction I got. But even then, you have it happen, but Hogan's not the champion. The Memphis mid-card piece of crap is still the champion, and we're going to have another title match later on in the night. Because fuck the people and fuck professional wrestling. And of course, 
you had to center around that mid-card Memphis piece of crap at a time that even without Stone Cold Steve Austin, the WWF still had main eventers like The Rock, Triple H, you had guys like Taker and Kane and all these others. And this was your world champion. Some slappy slap nuts. Memphis mid-card piece of crap. I, th I think I'm good. It's therapeutic, but then it's not really. But anyways, what really kills me about this night, looking back 17 years later, the same as it did back then, the feelings are still the same about it, the emotions are the same about it, is that on the one hand, my ultimate hero is getting fucked over in this just really stupid fucking way. On the flip side, it was Booker T's night. And even though earlier in the night, he had lost to Canyon Diamond Page, <laughs> whatever the hell he's called himself. Um, he had lost earlier in the night. Here was an opportunity for Booker T to have his moment. And as badly as I wanted to be angry, as badly as I wanted to, once that shit with Hogan and Russo happened, never watch any WCW ever again. It's one of those tricks of the wrestling business that they find a way to piss you off so much, but then at least in my case, give you something to fool you and suck you back in. And here was that moment. You got a real world title match, Memphis mid-card piece of crap defending against Booker T. And here's Booker T's moment to shine. And, and how unfortunate that it was all part of this great big circumstance of clusterfuck Russo bullshit. That it really took the shine off of what should have been a special moment. And in some ways it was still a special moment. Because you could hear the crowd chanting for Booker T. You could sense the crowd was really behind Booker T. The crowd wanted this for Booker T if for no other reason to have something to justify why the hell they went to that show that night. And get him over the bullshit that happened with Hogan and Russo. And once Booker T won that title, I marked out 17 years ago. And frankly, rewatching it, I marked out a little again. And those fans went crazy when it happened. It's just sad and tragic when you go back and look at it to see what this show really should be remembered for, which was Booker T becoming a world champion becomes an afterthought. Like a lot of people know, Booker was a five-time, 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 five-time WCW champion. What a lot of people forget is that his first world title win was here at Bash of the Beach 2000 because we all know ultimately what this show is remembered for. So while a fresh face, a younger talent, got an opportunity and gave you that happy go-home moment the show was still ruined by that point, 
and it unfortunately took some of the shine off of it, and that's sad. Bash at the Beach 2000, like other Bash at the Beaches, had something memorable happen. Like in 94, you had Hogan and Flair. 96, we all know what happened. The business changed significantly with the formation of the NWO. But just four short years later, we're running Hogan out of the company. We've got a slap nuts as our world champion. And even the glory of Booker getting his moment and getting his time to shine was ruined. WCW after this show was never the same for me. And I always had that feeling that it was only a matter of time that I was going to stop completely watching the product. I never did, but that was more so because Vince bought him out before I had a chance to stop. It's a shame. This show was a piece of shit because ultimately it had the stench and the smell of Vince Russo all fucking over it.